Well, um, I'm glad to look out to the audience and see that actually there are a lot of people, I'm sure, who actually was alive just like me during the Vietnam War and remember who Madame Nhu was. I mean, I was born after her, but her, the, her exile, but still I was born into the war and my family uh, know quite a bit about that history. Um, but Monique, I have to say that um, what surprised me most, uh, especially now listening to the introduction, is that here is someone who actually was sent out of Vietnam be, uh, because of her uh, relationship with the Ngo family and, and her role in the war, but into 1963, and you graduate in 2003. Um, <laughs> why would you be interested in Madame Nhu? Um, who wouldn't be interested in Madame Nhu? <laughs> She, um, from an early age, just captivated me. Everything that I had come to know about Vietnam, I was, I was born in 1976, so after the war had ended, and um, my father narrowly missed being drafted into the war. And so for me, Vietnam was this sort of images and books of, um, of all the terrible images of war that uh, my generation of America has come to associate with Vietnam, and nothing about what a beautiful or interesting country it was. It was really just defined for me as the war. So to see Madame New's picture jump out, and um, especially, you know, I think the captions called her the face of evil or something, mm. I, I had to know more. <laughs> well, um, before we get to her, there is a narrative that runs parallel in the book, which is your own relationship with her and your search for Madame New. And I think in some way, as a journalist who's been working for 20 years plus, I, uh, the investigative part is what I find really intriguing because you didn't know her address and here you are in Paris searching for her from sort of very loose pieces of information that you've seen. Um, tell the audience about this. Sure, so uh, if my husband was here, he would tell you that I'm very persuasive. Um, <laughs> and I really was determined to find Madame New. In all of my sort of initial research, I expected to find an obituary. and. There was no, nothing there. So um, everything I could sort of gather was that Madame New was still alive and living in Rome. Um, I spoke to a journalist from the New York Times who had spoken to her, and he said, yeah, as far as I know, she's still living in Rome. So um, a, a few people, I've talked to a few people here tonight about how I very much tried to study Vietnamese and humbly, <laughs> humbly admit that I didn't do a very good job of keeping up with it. But for a while, I was practicing. and. Part of my practicing is I would go online and pull these um, Vietnamese language articles and try to translate them hmm. and sort of keep my skills fresh. Well, one of these articles um, was written by a Vietnamese man living in the United States who claimed he had interviewed Madame Nhu. Hmm. I'd never heard of this guy. I had never heard of his journal. It was a, it was a Catholic Vietnamese uh, website. And, um, but all of a sudden, all of these sort of light bulbs went off in my head. And when he was talking about interviewing her, he said something about seeing the Eiffel Tower through her kitchen window. And I had already known that there was an apartment Madame New had gone to after, um, after she left Saigon, and it was an apartment in Paris that was just at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. So it kind of struck me that, huh, you know, maybe, maybe she is back there. Maybe it's not so crazy. So um, long story short, I looked around Paris for any tall buildings I could find around the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> and there aren't that many. So I started knocking on doors and very persistently uh, spoke to a concierge who said, no, no, you know, she's, she's not here. She's next door. So. Ah. <laughs> but that was not the end of it because, of course, um, I mean, in some way, um, in the book, um, she's portrayed a little bit like Marlene Dietrich, this mysterious woman who won't talk to anyone, who won't see anyone. And in some way, your, your, your story is about finding her, meeting her, and also trying to capture who she is. Um, so it, it was a long process of being in touch with her. So please tell us. It was about almost that. like a courtship, honestly. Um, I tried to, so first I tried to really impress her and seem very businesslike and smart, but she just put me in my place immediately, you know, because I was young and naive and what could I possibly know? Um, so but this is on the phone, right? This is all on the phone, exactly. Um, Matt, so the, f the first time that Madame New called me, um, I wasn't expecting her to call. I'd been writing her letters for months. I had been, you know, I had knocked on her door that day. I mean, I had done everything um, 
except for see her, and she called me out of the blue. So she dictated very early on the terms of our relationship, when she would call, who she would leave messages with, um, how, how I should address her, L very specific things. Mm. And in fact, in that first conversation that we had, she was really curious about, about m not so much me, but why was I, f why was I interested mm. in her? You know, who in your family works for the CIA? <laughs> Who's a government agent? And I was like, no one, I'm just, I'm just curious. Mm. So um, slowly I, um, so part of it was the, the first day that she called me. My husband and I had been trying to get pregnant and it had been a, a long process. That morning, I had taken a pregnancy test and found out I was pregnant, so I was overjoyed. And before I could even wake up my husband to tell him, Madame New is calling me on the phone. So I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but so part of this, I think, making her, um, getting her humanity out was, I told her early on, you know, that this had happened and this sort of coincidence. And right away, she was like, oh, it's not a coincidence. It's a sign from God. Mm -hmm. Right? This is meant to be. So there was this, um, and then it developed into a very sort of maternal thing. She would always call and ask about the children, and mm. we would really get into the nitty-gritty nitty of motherhood. I mean, Madame knew breastfed each of her children for at least six months, she told me, and, you know, she was very precise about about all of those things mm. that I wouldn't imagine the Dragon Lady to, yeah. <laughs> to be. Well, before we get to the Dragon Lady Sorry. narrative, I, I'm just curious, uh, how many people in the audience actually knows who, who, who she is, Madame New? Oh my, <laughs> that's quite a lot. Um, that's not, not your typical readers, I don't think, uh, these days, but who knows. Um, yeah, so can you tell us in a few short sentences a framework of who she is and why she's important in the Vietnam history? Sure. Well, Madame New was the first lady of South Vietnam from 1954 to 1963. And she was first lady on a bit of a technicality. Her brother-in-law was the president, Ngo Ding Ziem. And Ziem was a very um, moral, uh, very Catholic. He was married to his country, really. So he, he never took a wife. Um, so instead, it was Madame Nu was his younger brother's wife. And his younger brother, Nu, Ngo Ding Nu, did all of the politicking that uh, Ziem couldn't or wouldn't do. All of the sort of unsavory business of running a country with an iron fist. Um, so everything from running the secret police to um, uh, recruiting youth and running the, the uh, political party. And Madame New was really the face of the regime because she was beautiful, she was the hostess, she was, she was smart, she was well-spoken. And so um, I think initially the media was was charmed by her. She was so young too. When she became first lady, she was thirty years old. Hmm. So. Yeah, but in some way she, I hate to put it in this way, but her career went up went up in flame. I mean, mm -hmm. pun intended. Literally, uh, because of the self immolation and what she actually said. And this is what, in some way, unfortunately, is what she's remembered by. Absolutely. So. Um, in 1963 is really when she got the most press. She was on the cover of um, the Saturday Evening Post, Newsweek, uh, Life Magazine, Paris Match. I mean, you name it, Madame New was on the cover of it, and it wasn't for anything good. It was, um, as Andrew was saying, in the summer of 1963, there was a, a Buddhist crisis in Vietnam, and um, the Buddhists were uh, um, speaking out against the Ziem regime, and the Ziem regime was n not responding in a way that was very good PR. Madame knew, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but she said sort of, oh, good, you know, a monk is self-immolating. Great, we'll have a barbecue. She was sort of like a Marie Antoinette. Um, she came across as very cool, cruel. And at that time, all of, all of America knew of Vietnam really in this sort of loose way, like, oh, yeah, we're, we're helping these people, we're saving them from communism, and we're doing this really good thing. And here was, um, here was suddenly a very ugly, dark side to the regime that the Americans were helping, so. Well, one thing I didn't know uh, was that she actually was not raised Catholic, um, and in fact converted when she married uh, Ngo Ninh Nhu. 
Um, I had always thought um, being French, as she was, um, a French citizen, I, I'm not sure, but she was a French citizen. Her father was. Yeah, that they are naturally sort of converting to Catholicism, but in fact they were Buddhist. And this is an interesting thing because, you know, a lot of Vietnamese families are sort of split in many ways and the religious divide.